let's get started for the day. I appreciate that you guys showed up. That's so usually in these last lecture sets, so that's not a given. So it's uh, cool. Uh, you know, I sent out a survey, and I was totally expecting guys to respond. You want to learn about deep learning and shape, and nobody did. That's fine. Save me work. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, instead, uh, uh, a couple of you guys mentioned topics that are kind of close to my research, and obviously I got a lot of slides around on that, um, so that's, that's easy for me to do. Uh, it actually touches on a lot of the themes of, of, of things people are asking about anyway, so I figured I could basically give my own course project uh, presentation today, and then on Thursday we'll uh, listen to all of yours. Uh, there are people in my office hours this morning with varying degrees of completeness for their projects. Um, if you're in panic mode right now, please see me after class. I'm going to be traveling tomorrow in New York City, so I will respond to emails when I see them, but I have to give a talk at 5, so I'll be kind of on and off uh, until that point. Um, and it's a talk of political scientists, uh, science. I'm told totally you I'm drinking after the talk, so you'll we'll see. Uh, uh, right, so in, in any event, um, any last words, questions, thoughts, words. comments about your, you know? Blessings before your, your, your final project. Cool. So don't forget, if you haven't already, to link your slides on the spreadsheet. And uh, yeah, we'll see you on, on Thursday for that. Uh, yeah, so I, I thought I'd tell you guys today about uh, research that's kind of well aligned with things that we've covered in this course uh, that's going on in my own group here at MIT, which synthesizes some of the interesting ideas that we've already heard about. Kind of nice. Uh, and uh, opens a bunch of, of additional questions to think about. Uh, and, and that involves uh, volumetric shape analysis. So, uh, right, so essentially, I'd say about 82% of the material that we covered in 6838 involved surfaces specifically, right? And, and understanding triangular surfaces, point clouds, all these, these different representations that essentially have two dimensional structure. And we did all kinds of neat stuff to them, we computed. Laplacians and curvature and, and, and transport and segmentation, all the, and basically anything you can do to a mesh, I think we 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 pretty safely covered here. Um, one of the interesting questions that shows up uh, in geometry and, and one that a, a couple students in, in our group have been been looking at pretty in, intensively, as say some of the more mathematically oriented students, uh, involves uh, looking at volumes rather than surfaces. So in particular, for example, you know, if I'm modeling a, a human body, right? Um, in fact, I think you guys had this data uh, uh, in, in, in some of your assignments. Right? It's a triangle mesh on the outer surface, but the reality is that you're filled with, with meat. You know? And, and uh, the, the, the analysis of that geometry doesn't have to be the same. Right? So for instance, uh, if I have you know, some thick object like that, right? if I think of it as a one-dimensional object and I kind of roll it along the plane like it's uh, you know, the bottom of, of a tank, the, the intrinsic geometry doesn't change that much. In other words, you know, if I roll it so that like this point kind of moves to the right and it moves to the left, right? Distances along the outer circle haven't haven't actually been modified. But obviously, if you cut through the interior, right, the geometry is different, right? And, and um, somehow that theme gets lost, right? So when we talk about uh, shape analysis for meshes, oftentimes the algorithms that we've covered in this class uh, can do some really bizarre things. So, like for instance, when we talk about uh, mapping and correspondence, a very typical thing uh, that can come out of some of these unsupervised algorithms is like the left hand gets mapped to the left hand, the right hand gets mapped to the right hand, and then the feet swap. And some of that's because this twist down the trunk is actually not that high distortion, as long as it's distributed down your, 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 your middle. Yeah? Uh, because again, you can't see through the body using these techniques. Uh, and, and, and so um, an extreme example of that is shown on the slide here. So here are two cubes that, uh, from the Laplacian's perspective, are identical. So. Uh, and the reason, remember the, the Laplace operator is intrinsic, right? It only knows about distances along the surface. So what I did here is I took a cube, uh, and then I added this little bump like that, right? And I can take that bump and just flip it on its head to go inward, and I can do that completely originally just by taking scissors, taking it, flipping it, and putting it back, right? And so intrinsically, these are the same surface. And what that means, if you think about it, even from a machine learning perspective, right? If I use for example, like a very typical way to learn from, from 3D shape would be to compute its Laplacian stuff and then put that into a learning pipeline because this is like a vector. Um, no algorithm where that's step one would be able to distinguish these two objects, even though I think we would all agree they're quite different. Yeah? Uh, and, and this is really basically state of the art <laughs> in, in, in a lot of, of shape analysis pipelines. Uh, so in, in this class, we talked about a lot of different tasks and we, we've used similar pipelines, right? Whether it was uh, correspondences, or trying to understand databases of shapes, 
Um, one that we'll talk about today that we haven't covered quite as much uh, in this class is, is meshing and tiling and these sorts of kind of discrete problems. Um, but in each case, I think, sort of to you know, summarize and wrap things up in terms of what, the way that we've approached these things, there's a certain aesthetic to producing these, these geometry uh, techniques that seem to work well in the lab. Right? Uh, and, and so the type of, of considerations we've talked about include you know, cooking up algorithms that are efficient. Um, for shape analysis specifically, we talk a lot about discriminative algorithms. In other words, like being able to tell the difference between two shapes is obviously pretty critical if you're trying to cut through a database of shapes. Um, but at the same time, maybe you want to be resilient to noise. So one, so one uh, consideration is, is maybe making your algorithm sort of explicitly multi-scale. Like, do I care about big features or small features? Does like added texture on my surface count as noise, or is it the critical feature to care about? Right? The Laplacian is a great example of an operator that, that, that separates that kind of stuff out pretty cleanly. Right? Um, and then certainly, so the first thing I think are, are really critical for a computational environment before, uh, maybe more so for writing an academic paper, but it does, there's some uh, correspondence between that and, and, and sort of stability of your technique, is that a lot of the things that we've talked about in this class are sort of well justified from the perspective of differential geometry, right? We've developed a lot of notions of, of discrete differential geometry and so on. But there's a big problem uh, with many of the techniques we've already talked about, uh, and I think uh, <laughs> my friend Dan Raviv uh, illustrated this really well. Most of the algorithms that we talked about in this course don't really do things like process 3D hands. They, they think of hands like rubber gloves, right? And, and really, when you think about like, the deformations that I can do to my data that more or less preserve the analytical tools that, that we've been developing in this course, they really don't correspond to like, the motions of your hand, right? They're closer to like, you know, if I bend the fingers of the glove and it buckles, that's much closer to isometry than, than, than what you would see on, on the volume on the right-hand side. And that's a problem. Right? And, and, and so there's been a big effort to kind of take these cool classical ideas that we've covered in this course and, and try to make them work for volumetric data. Uh, and we'll see that it kind of requires you to go back and question everything we thought we knew uh, about shape analysis to a remarkable degree. And I think this actually comes as a bit of a surprise. Uh, that like somehow it seems like, oh, what do you do? We take all of our other our algorithms and instead of triangle meshes, you just bump them up to touch a huge meshes and life is good. Um, already asymptotically in trouble because there are way more tests than there are triangles. Um, but we'll see even mathematically, this is a totally different object. Um, and, and for a lot of reasons. So here's, here's one good example. So here I've taken a sphere and I've meshed it two different ways. So I've filled its interior with these little tetrahedral objects. Now, one of the interesting things from sort of a shape analysis perspective, this is different in medical imaging, but the interiors of the spheres are uninteresting here. Do you guys see that? Like, the interesting geometry in comparing these things as 3D objects is still the outside surface. <laughs> it's just interpreted differently, right? Rather than thinking of it like a two-dimensional object, we're thinking of it as the boundary of a three-dimensional thing. But like, all this work that we went to to take intrinsic derivatives and do covariant things and lead derivatives and so on are irrelevant here. Because the interior geometry, how do you take derivatives? It's just x, y, and z. Right? There's nothing cool there at all. Um, However, if you take any of the algorithms we've covered in this course and apply it to these two different objects, you'll get two different outputs. Even if the outer surface, like the set of triangles on the outside, is identical. And that's like kind of a frightening thing to think about. Right? That in other words, the interesting geometry in these volumetric problems is still two-dimensional. It's just interpreted in a different fashion. Um, and then, of course, but on the other hand, you know, uh, the intrinsic structure that we've developed in this course is incomplete. Uh, and so even if you're, you're talking about you know, machine learning algorithms that are built on these things, um, somehow in step zero of your algorithm, you've thrown away about 50% of the information you could use, uh, which may or may not be relevant uh, to, to the stuff that you're doing. And so, so for today, um, partially because it, it, it responds a little bit to the requests we have for lecture like, topics, which are a little, little sparse, uh, and, and, and partially because it is a nice sort of synthesis of, of some things we've covered here, uh, I thought I'd tell you about some of the, the efforts we have at MIT on, on geometry processing and volumes as opposed to surfaces. Just to give you an indication of like what a subtle research area this is, that like a very small change to your problem creates a completely new uh, set of approaches. Um, and I think this is a very typical theme in this area. In fact, I think if you like read, read the geometry processing literature from the 90s, they sort of treat all these problems as solved until they actually try to realize that nothing works. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about it in three different, three different contexts. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit about sort of spectral problems and Laplacian, since that's our, our sort of bread and butter in, in A3A. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about uh, meshing problems in fields, which we also learned a bit. And then somebody requested online asking, I think it was Colton asked about um, 
Lava set methods, and, and conveniently, we just published a lava set method for, for, for some other metrics stuff, um, coupled to a very different application, uh, and, and we'll introduce that in the end uh, if we have some time. Okay, so, uh, right, so let's talk about some shape features. So hopefully by now you guys are, are intimately familiar with the world of spectral geometry and all the cool things you can learn by uh, hitting the Stanford buddy with a hammer and observing either the vibration modes or the frequencies, right, and things as useful for for shape retrieval, comparison, computing distortion, basically almost anything you want to do to a shape you can get out of this operator. And this is extremely powerful uh, perspective. Uh, and, and one of the big vocabulary words that we had in A3A was that uh, these algorithms are isometry invariant, and somehow that's a good thing. Um, but if you think back to that example with the rubber glove, all right, well, isometry invariant algorithms are really great if you're doing rubber glove processing, but for hand processing, less so. Right? There's a bunch of stretch that's happening. Um, when, when you deform. And, and so it actually makes some sense to kind of go back. Right? So in, in other words, these objects really aren't the same. But uh, calculations on a volume are expensive. Right? So I could take the Laplace, and Laplace makes perfect sense on a volume. Um, right? In some sense, it's easier to derive, because right? you don't have to worry about curvature. Uh, but it turns out to get the level of accuracy you would need, you would need asymptotically another factor of n. So the algorithms we talked about that were fast, uh, become really slow. <laughs> yeah? uh, and, and, and so one of the, the interesting research problems that, that continues to persist now is can you come up with techni techniques that have the nice advantages that we like from spectral geometry, right? that they're kind of multi-scale and noise resilient and all that good stuff, but still are just computed from the boundary because, again, so all these tets, they're just taking up space. They're not doing anything interesting. Yeah? Uh, and, 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 and that's a, an interesting challenge. So I can, uh, show you two different ways to do it that, that we've thought about a little bit here, which conveniently align pretty well uh, with, with, with stuff that we've done. And so here's a, a paper from a couple years ago in uh, ACM Transactions and Graphics. I think at this point you guys probably have seen all of these names uh, in different permutations and combinations of uh, papers we've had to read in this, this course. Uh, and again, this, this returns to this idea of, of uh, functional maps that I mentioned very briefly. So as a reminder, here are two different shapes. There's this guy and this guy, yeah? And, uh, you know, functional maps, my goal is I'm given these two surfaces and I'd like to find a mapping from points to one on points to the other. Yeah? And so my unknown here is the map phi. And the observation in functional maps is if I have that map phi, and now I take my can of neon spray paint and I paint the guy on the right, then I can transfer that paint to the guy on the left, right? But for every point here, I follow the mapping to his corresponding point there. Now I see a color, and I copy that color back. Yeah? So for every map from left to right, there's a functional map from right to left that takes like colors or numbers or whatever in the opposite direction. Yeah? There's covariant and contravariant things going on. Okay, uh, and, and so that will we'll notate uh, uh, S sub five. So now we're going to add a, one more layer on top of this. So, you know, in this class we like to, to cover stuff and then start just jamming them together pairwise and seeing what happens. Okay, so, so functional maps is a useful technique for correspondence. We really like Laplace operators. You guys have totally reasonable questions, which is what happens if you put the two together. Uh, and there's a really interesting story hiding here. So here's our two guys, right? They're there. And they have a map uh, in between them here. A functional map is good enough. And now I claim I have, so, so I can think of taking an inner product of functions. In fact, when we talked about exterior calculus, we covered this, right? Where if I have two functions, f and g, I give the think of their dot product as I multiply them pointwise and I integrate over the surface. Yeah? So this is like a quadratic form that sits on R to the vertices. Yeah? So now if I have a functional map from say uh, the guy on the right to the guy on the left, I claim I actually have two of these inner product matrices. Right? One where I can take two functions, take their dot product here. And another one where I can take two functions, push both of those functions to the other surface, and then take their dot product. Right? If you think about it, that's like pulling this guy's inner product form back to the first one. Okay? So the really beautiful observation which happened in this, this work by Rustamov in 20, oh boy, 13, 2013, so you know, what, six, six, seven years ago, uh, is, uh, is the following. That, well, okay, so I have these two different inner products. First of all, what happens if my map is on isometry? Then those inner products are actually the same. Do you see that? Because if it's an isometry, in particular, I preserve areas, yeah? So the area element is just identified. I can push it forward and take a dot product, nothing changes, yeah? And then as my map deviates from the isometry, these become different numbers, yeah? 
So discreetly, what are these, these objects? They're just matrices, right? They're, they're just dot product matrices. They have like F transpose matrix G. Yeah? So one thing I could do uh, is I can compare these two things, right? I can, I can look at uh, the inverse of one of these inner product matrices times the other one. So what is that product if my map is in the geometry? The identity. The identity matrix. Yeah? And as my map deviates from isometry, that thing becomes less and less identity. And in fact, one thing that you can prove is that it actually encodes the distortion of area on your surface. So if you do, if you need the SVD of that matrix, what you'll find is that the high order singular vectors correspond to places where your surface stretches, and the low order singular vectors correspond to places where it compresses. That takes a little bit of convincing. I'll, I'll let you stare at that for a minute. Uh, you, in, in, in addition to that, so that, that dot product story, uh, we can lift it to H1 inner product, which is a fancy term here. So let's say I have differentiable functions on my surface. And now I can take the gradient because they're differentiable. And I can take the dot products of these and then integrate over the surface. Do you guys remember from lecture 9-ish what this operator is? Like F transpose to some, some matrix times another times G. What's that matrix in between? There's like only one matrix in between. The Laplacian, right? Because if I integrate by parts, I move that thing over here, I get to have a grad. So now I have two Laplace operators, right? I can have the inner product of the Laplace on the first surface, or I can push forward my functions on the other guy, then take their Laplaces and take their inner product. And if I compare those two objects, uh, it turns out what, what it encodes are differences in angles. This kind of makes sense. Remember, the Laplace has cotangent sitting here. Yeah? And in fact, uh, what was proven in, in, in Rafe's work is that if I know these inner product matrices, and I know the lengths and angles on one surface, then I can recover lengths and angles on the other. This doesn't make sense. It's kind of like just multiplying my But the way that he proves that is, he, this is actually a theoretical result. Like, they, they show that for the actual, like, the smooth Laplace operators. Um, one question you might ask is, well, we know all these things are, are well defined, right? The, so the, the inner product thing is really that mass matrix we talked about. And then the conformal inner product, the one with the gradients, that's like the Laplace operator, and the cotangent matrix. Yeah, you could ask exactly the same question in the discrete differential geometry context. And then unsurprisingly, what comes out is, is you can recover the edge lengths of your triangle mesh given these, these two matrices. Is that a good thing or a bad thing from a volumetric perspective? You don't have the angle. You don't have angles. Well, you do have some angles. You have, you have the, inner, the uh, interior angles of, of the triangles. What are you missing? I can, make a, I can make a suggestive gesture here. Right? So if I have two triangles that, that hinge about a shared edge, I'm deforming isometrically if I do that. Yeah? And so if all I know are the lengths of the edges here, I cannot recover the 3D surface. And, and so, um, right, so, so what set us on to thinking about all these volumetric problems is if I knew the Laplacian of the full volume, I could. Uh, and, and, and so that, that was the question, is can I, can I reconstruct from that information? Um, so the answer is, there's actually like kind of a surprising fact about rigidity, which is that you almost always can re reconstruct one of these meshes from their edge lengths, but the algorithm for doing so is, is extremely complicated and, and never works in practice. Um, but there's a simple solution here, which is to take our surface and uh, introduce a second surface where I just displace every vertex along its normal a tiny, tiny bit. And if you think about it, that modifies edge lengths in some interesting ways. So like for instance, if, if you take a close look at this torus, right? What happens to edge lengths on the interior part of the torus when you displace along the normal? They, uh, what does it? Yeah, they, they shrink. <laughs> and so in hyperbolic places, they shrink. On the outside, it expands. This makes sense. Like, think about taking an extreme, right? I have a donut, make it fatter and fatter and fatter, eventually the inside pinches together, right? So the edge lengths can be really short. That side gets a little chubby. And, uh, right, and it turns out uh, that the rate of change of that edge length is exactly the di it gives you it, it gives you a way of reading off the dihedral angle on, on, on the, the triangular surface, uh, and so originally we had two shape differences, right? One area and one conformal. If I now make that four, so area and conformal, and then area and conformal of this this displaced guy, then I really can reconstruct my, my mesh up to range of motion. And this is our first kind of corny example of a volumetric algorithm. But here the volume is the this tiny little sliver of volume that's that's. Is sandwiched between the surface and its, and its lift. So not really what we started with, but but uh, 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 it's really nice fun. And if you want to see, it actually does make a difference. So here, um, Raif took these uh, these 3D cubes and we put two bumps on them, 
we vary the height of the bump from in to out. Yeah. And now, the, one of the really nice advantages of these shape difference operators, right? It's, it's very difficult to do like principal component analysis on a collection of shapes. It doesn't really make any sense. They all have different numbers of vertices. Yeah. Um, but you can do principal component analysis on these shape difference matrices because they're all matrices on the same base mesh as the vertices. Uh, so here's uh, PCA using the Laplacian. Um, and you see that there's clusters of four points. Do you guys see why? So remember, I took, there are two different bumps on two faces of the cube. And I could bump them different heights, all the way from inside to outside. So there's always clusters of four for inside and outside and the discrete symmetry of the cube. Yeah. Um, whereas if we just introduce this little offset and we do the same thing, we can see you're covering the full uh, set of PCA axis. This is a nice elegant way to do uh, sort of the beginnings of statistical uh, shape analysis. Um, Monday, you look suspicious. Sure. Yeah, so let's, let's think about it for a second. Um, so let's say that I have a, uh, a base shape. Here it is. And I have a whole collection of other shapes. I want to do PCA. I'm trying to understand how they vary from one another. That's hard. These aren't vectors. I can't, I can't add them and subtract them. They're in different spaces. Right? But what the, the shape difference stuff says is like maybe I have a little function over here. So it's like L1, L2, L3, and so on. What this does is hold all of them back to the same base surface, right? So here's L0, right? So uh, in effect, what happens? Well, uh, the shape difference is going to look something like L0 inverse, and then you're going to have a functional map, right? So this is going to take functions to the other guy, right? So this is like F1, and then apply the function 1, and then F1 transpose, maybe, that's what's on top of This thing is an operator on functions Q. Does that make sense? So if I have my whole collection of shapes, I get a whole collection of operators over here. Where you know, so here's maybe a shape difference one, here's maybe shape difference two. And so on. And these are all in the same space. They're all operators on the vertices of the, the base. These I could think of like vectors and do PCA on, right? And so that's the trick, is that you pull all of these guys' operators back onto one object. Now when I do principal component analysis, so I take these ginormous things and reduce them to two dimensions, uh, what ends up coming out is a really nice way to organize my data set here. Uh, and that's what you're seeing uh, in this figure. Does make more sense? Cool. Uh, and in fact, you can actually reconstruct from this information. So if, uh, if you guys want a good baseline for your, your projects do, uh, what, tomorrow, day after? Um, so here is a, a project from one of the Europe's in our research group. Uh, and, and what he did is he mapped a, a collection of shapes into this base space. And now it makes sense to do things like draw splines. You can connect them with, with curves, right? Because they're all in the same space. And then he inverted and, and put the spaces back in 3D. And it gives you a nice shape interpolation technique. So here's uh, how Lee moving his face around. Uh, so here's one of the old sort of splines in the space of, of discrete shells. I think we kind of briefly mentioned in class as a way of computing shortest paths between shapes as triangle meshes. These are extremely expensive to uh, compute. But it has a nice elastic structure. And here's, uh, so here's their output. You can see that there's a very coarse set of frames. This is uh, not unlike uh, Yijang's uh, project. Yeah, so anyway, this is done by an undergrad in our group in a semester. So I, mean, I don't know, these people in the office hours this morning. High standing for you. Just, just kidding. Okay. Uh, anyway. uh, yeah. It's remarkably stable. Okay, so in all of these algorithms, um, yeah? How is it different from like, the keyframes you can make in Mitchell Software? How do you make the keyframes? Like, how is it different from the keyframes? Oh, I see. Yeah, so. Um, so the keyframes here are, are generated as, as like a mesh deformation. So I, I just have to regulate the surface and uh, you know to, I deform it elastically into these different poses. Um, but these are not articulated 3D models. I haven't given them like joints into how they bend, right? And so if I interpolate, uh, so let's say that I have a human model. Here's one, and uh, you know I have one pose with your arm up, another pose with the arm down, 
What do I get as my in-between frame if I interpolate vertex positions? Because you won't have an arm. It'll just be squashed, right? <laughs> and so that's where this kind of stuff is needed. So if you were to do it in a tool like Maya, you would do a very different thing, which is called articulation, where you would say, well, actually, all these vertices don't move together. There's a few uh, bones and things that are kind of rigid, and, and I have to go back and add a whole skeleton to my mesh and do it all at the same time. So these kinds of methods are designed to skip it. So you just design the key focus and, and go directly to an animation. Yeah. This is like a sort of pet research project that a lot of people like to do. So it's, it's this automatic uh, in between. Yeah. Yeah. So for this sequence, why are the these two fingers unfolding and refolding? Yeah. Good something? catch. Yeah. So these uh these 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 hand uh, the the hands on this uh, model here. This is this algorithm actually is just using the shape difference. Um, without the extrinsic information out. And so you, if you look really closely, you can see uh, that the, the, it actually behaves like a rubber glove. The finger collapses a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, I can check that. Um, yeah, so and, and in terms of the, I think there's a few key things in the last sequence which makes sense. Not interesting. Cool. So that's just, uh, that's just one representation. Um, but of course, I, I didn't really follow through on my promise. Right? We were going to talk about surfaces of volumes, and, and so far we constructed a new volume by like making a thin shell and, and talked about that. Not quite the same. Yeah? Um, so one of the interesting things that, that's going to show up in ACM transactions on graphics uh, this year, we should ignore the 2017 team, I should update this slide, um, really tries to do that. So uh, in, in this class, we talked quite a bit about uh, this optimization problem at the top of our slide here. This is our favorite, right? Um, so what is f if I define it using minimum, uh, you know, first of all, what is the objective function called? Duration energy. energy. Yeah. This is just saying square integrates to one. Yeah. So what are the critical points of this problem here? The Laplacian eigenfunctions, right? I don't know, that's how we got there. Yeah. Um, so but one, and, and here, the, notice the integrals are over the surface. Yeah? So the easiest way to do volumetric Shape analysis just to replace the integrals with ones over the volume that's expensive. So one kind of weird thing you can do is you can take the integral over the volume for the objective function and the integral over the surface for the constraint. And what you get back is something really interesting. Um, X, what the heck? We've got a little more time than we usually do research talk. Let's just derive it for quick. Okay, so <laughs> this is an answer to design. Uh, a little bit of math that we did a long time ago. So, in other words, uh, the, the problem that I'm looking for is to find critical points of uh, the functional integral over the volume of the gradient of the function squared, subject to the constraint that you're going to integrate over the surface, which is the boundary of the volume, the absolute value of the function squared. Uh, equals one. How are we going to derive a, a, a PDE from this? It's your favorite, all the way from homework one, yeah? I'm going to take a variational derivative. Okay? So let's do it. So first of all, um, if this has a constraint, so we need Lagrange multipliers. Yeah, so, so let's write a Lagrangian. So we can see F given this guy, given the integral over the volume of to f and lambda are solutions of our original problem. Hopefully the story is familiar by now in this course. This happens to be kind of a good set of topics to just hit all the stuff that we talked about this semester. Yep. So, uh, right, so, so, so what do we do? We take d over d h of this guy of f plus h g, where g is some arbitrary function um, at h, our favorite. Remember? That's our, and it's the same, how many hundred times have we written down this little formula here? Okay. Um, right. So remember that really, uh, let's do uh, this. <laughs> so uh, this is like 
gradient f plus h gradient w g. So far, I think we're good. Okay. Oh, and this is uh, H equals zero. Okay. Uh, right. So what's going to happen when we do that? Let's see if we can we can eyeball. So I'm going to expand the square. Right. I'll get gradient of f squared plus two h gradient of f dot gradient of g plus h squared times the gradient of g squared. So when I differentiate with respect to h, the only thing that's going to remain is that middle guy. Right, because I also plug in h equals zero, so this is going to look like right. uh, grad two grad f dot grad g like that. I think I did that right. Uh, minus the integral over the boundary. Uh, similarly, of um, two h. Oh no, h. Lagrangian multiplier. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So remember how our arguments went in this class? Like, what did we do? So remember, g is arbitrary here. Yeah? So uh, the first thing that we might do is just worry about f restricted to the interior of the domain, and then the other one might be to worry about f on the boundary. Right? Because I can choose g to be anything I want. So in particular, I could choose my test function g to just be 0 on the, the boundary. Yeah. By the way, this is, of course, the same uh, as uh, what? Well, I can, I can integrate my parts. Yeah. And what am I going to get? I'm going to get a boundary term again of something. We'll come back to that. Uh, minus, uh, actually, in this class, we have little functions of minus infinity. Yeah. Um, G is plus F, like that. D, uh, Lambda and the lambda surface, uh, two, uh, there should be twos everywhere. Cool? Okay, so let's say that I just worry about the interior. So I'm going to choose the test function g, which is zero everywhere on the, the, the boundary. Right? Nothing interesting happens in g near the boundary. So in effect, I can ignore the first and third term. What conclusion can I draw? I can, well, yeah, I can draw the following conclusion, which is the function of f is identically equal to the zero in the interior of the domain. Why does that matter? Does anybody recognize this equation? This is called the Laplace equation, right? And now we're just in a volume. So this is actually known in closed form. So if you take a PDE course, one thing you, you'll, you'll learn is that if the function of f is zero and you have data on the outside, then you're going to just interpolate f to the inside, and this is just a linear operator. What does this argument show you? Do I actually need f in the interior of my volume? No, it's just, there's just a formula for it. If I know that f on the boundary, it's, I, I can just get this in terms of Green's functions of, of the possible um, and, and that's the really key uh, observation here, is that I get some volumetric information by virtue of integrating here, but by leaving my constraint on the surface, I can do all of my calculations there and, 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 and just ignore uh, type matching altogether. It's a sneaky trick. And this uh, operator, the thing that ends up coming out, is something called the Dirichlet to Neumann operator. So it looks like this. So I have a function on the boundary of a dom domain. I interpolate it to the interior. So that's like taking the rainbow color on the outside, making it rainbow on the inside. And then I differentiate that and restrict that back to the boundary again. And that's, if you compose all these steps together, this is just a boundary operator. And that's the really neat thing, because you never need to touch the inside of your volume, and you still get volumetric information when you do it. Um, and in fact, this operator, which is the thing that will come out when you take the first variation on the boundary, we're not going to do that here because it's added, um, has a lot of really beautiful properties. Um, if you take the Taylor series of the heat kernel of this thing, which at this point in this class should kind of parse, yeah? Uh, 
what you get is that the first term is 1 over 2 pi, the second term gives you mean curvature of the surface, the third term gives you mean curvature plus gas curvature, so you get everything you need to reconstruct. Uh, and furthermore, uh, you can prove a fun theorem. We are not going to prove this thing in class. Uh, and in fact, let's ignore all the boring parts and just look at the, the relevant one, uh, which is that under certain conditions, if I have a map from one surface into another, and it preserves this particular operator, necessarily that map is a rigid motion. Is that true for a Laplace operator? No, right? Because a Laplace operator can't, can't deal with hinging. Yeah? And, and so essentially, the kind of nice thing here is that you can take this directly to normal operator, and all the algorithms we've already talked about in these classes just drop it in where you, you used to have uh, Laplace, uh, and out comes something that knows something about volumes. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of convenient thing. What do you pay? So this operator, it turns out, is, is something called a pseudo-differential operator. And that pseudo is really a problem. So, so what that means is, is, in order to actually compute it, the formula uh, for, you know, if I know u on the boundary, I know u in the interior, is annoying. If you guys have taken a PDE course, you've probably seen lots of formulas that look like this. Um, but the basic point here is that the matrix that you get out is dense. Right? So all this, this obsession that we have in this course about sparsity doesn't apply. Um, so there are some algorithms out there that try to address that. There's something called fast multipole. Uh, fun fact, this was voted one of the top 10 algorithms of the 20th century by people in an obscure math journal that I'm really entertained by. Uh, uh, that try to approximate this operator. But I think there's a lot of open questions, specifically in the context of uh, spectral shape analysis for how to, to make these kinds of techniques fast. But in any event, uh, let's look at some pictures. So here, uh, so the eigenfunctions of directly to Neumann operator are called Steklov eigenfunctions. Um, they show up in two places. One is here. The other is in something called the sloshing problem, which is probably very familiar to the undergraduates in our class. Uh, so, so in the sloshing problem, I have a glass full of beer. And I, so that fills up a volume. And now I shake the beer in the glass. Right? And, and the low frequency waveforms on the, on the surface on the top of the glass, they're actually aware of the volume underneath the, the glass surface. right? Like, oftentimes in computer graphics, when we simulate a fluid, we just simulate it as like a trampoline sitting on the top. But that's actually false, right? When I, when I simulate a fluid, there's a whole bucket of water sitting underneath it that's affecting the dynamics. So it's a first order. That, that dynamical system that's telling you how the geometry is moving is exactly the eigenfunctions of, of a, a mixed version of, of uh, Steckel where, where you have kind of Neumann conditions on the surface, the free surface, and Dirichlet conditions on the, the side of the map. When you put all that stuff together, and compute eigenfunctions, you can slash in here. I'm always trying to convince somebody to implement this in a video game so you have really realistic beer and carry it around. <laughs> uh, uh, I can't, nobody, nobody listens to me. Okay, but, but if you look at the eigenfunctions of these operators, uh, you can actually see some interesting patterns. So here's this, this dragon. He's another member of the pantheon of 3D models we see a lot in computer graphics. Uh, and, and the dragon has an interesting property from a, a geometry perspective. So from an intrinsic geometry perspective, that dragon is roughly a toilet paper tube. Right? Because this thing is just a giant cylinder. Right? This bending is actually not a very significant uh, uh, geometric or, uh, uh, feature. It is eventually. If you go far enough in the discussion, you'll see it. Right? But if, you, if you look at the low order eigenfunctions, they just kind of look like the eigenfunctions of the cylinder. If you compute the eigenfunctions of the Steklov operator, you can see that they're localized on the different folds. And, and, and that makes a lot of sense intuitively. Right? If I made this guy out of rubber and I shook it, right, it would tend to hinge about these 180 degree turns that you see on the surface. Right? Uh, and, and these operators have some interesting properties. So for instance, um, here's a donut. Uh, if I slice my donut in half, um, so I just, you can see if you look really closely, there's two little chops here. The Laplacian-based surface analysis just totally does. Right? Uh, and this is actually a big problem, practically speaking. So uh, anybody have any guess, like the, the, the state-of-the-art technique for modeling 3D tables in CAD, computer aided design? It's real simple. You take a rectangle and you jam four rectangles into the bottom, and as long as they interpenetrate, they look like a table. But the Laplacian based shape analysis will think of that as four unglued rectangles, five unglued rectangles. Uh, and that's really a problem. Um, but this thing, because it's a boundary integral, if I remove a few terms from boundary integrals, no big deal, uh, is actually stable to that kind of change. Uh, and you can use different distances, so like here's you know, uh, distance from the top to the bottom of a disk, obviously, if it's on the Laplacian, it's a very far apart. Uh, but if you're volume away, they're close together. Okay, so anyway, 
Hopefully you guys can see that just lifting geometry processing one dimension leads to all kinds of open challenging problems. I mean, this is a fun object in theory. In practice, it's still quite difficult to work with. It's a big dense matrix, uh, and, and the numerics are, are quite challenging uh, and quite different from the finite element method that we talked about in this class. So to make this work, you need a tool called the boundary element method, unsurprisingly, uh, which has all kinds of crazy new singularities and things you have to cope with. It's kind of like using the finite element method where your finite element functions are Green's functions in Laplacian. So like the solutions of, of Laplace equals zero. But the problem is that solutions of Laplace equals zero look like one over R squared, right? So there's a singularity there that you have to integrate out, um, which is no fun at all. So that's one example of taking something we've covered in this class, lifting the dimension and all hell breaks loose. Uh, let's look at another example. Uh, and, and that has to do with, with field-guided meshing. So remember, if you remember Ed's lecture on, on frame fields, one of the big applications for vector fields on surfaces is on mesh is for meshing, right? So what we did is you, you have a triangle mesh, but you like you get quad mesh, and so you saw one of these frame fields that put a little plus sign on every triangle, and those are roughly the sides of a quad that you, you that you use to align your, your mesh to. Okay? So there exists a volumetric version of this problem, which is called hexahedral remeshing. So here's what it looks like on the right hand side. Here's a hexahedral mesh of a sphere, uh, and and so what does that mean? That means that I take the volume enclosed by the outer surface of the sphere and fill it with little cube-shaped elements. Yeah? Uh, and, and naively, it, 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 it kind of feels like you should be able to take these nice vector field techniques we have and lift it to this case, right? Like from, from 20 feet away where you guys are sitting, it, it, it certainly looks like that. Um, if we look a little bit closer at this hex mesh, we can see that indeed some of the same things that we talked about in this class pop up. Remember that the key feature in vector fields is all about singular points? Right, so like, when we talked about vector fields on surfaces, you know, there's you know places where your vector field is boring, and then there's points where maybe your vector field circulates like that, or maybe there are points where your vector field has some kind of hyperbolic looking structure, and so on. Right, and there's this hop punk right there, which involves looking at the index of my field. I draw a little loop and I count the number of times I go around the clock face. That tells me a lot about vectors. And there's a similar thing going on in this mesh. So, uh, for instance, what's so special about this point? <laughs> so in general, if I have a grid of cubes, let's forget about the boundary for a second. Every edge is adjacent to four cubes. Think Legos. And every vertex is adjacent to eight cubes. What happened here? <laughs> there's three. And indeed, just like there are singular points in vector fields, there's a graph embedded in the interior of this volume that's all the edges on which, uh, around which you don't have four neighbors. Yeah? Uh, and, and, and that's sort of the relevant object when you're thinking about topology of these, these three uh, uh, things. Okay? So the question is, can we take this field-guided picture from 2D and just lift it one dimension? Uh, and indeed, that's something that a lot of people have tried. So there, there's this, this uh, technique here, you have a you know, a tent mesh of your sphere, and you compute a frame field, just like we had, you know, a little plus sign on the surface. Here you would compute three orthogonal directions per point in a volume, right? That's like the sides of the cube, kind of. You compute that smoothly and then use it to place the cubes. The question is, well, there's two questions. One is, how, how easy is this problem? Turns out this problem is ridiculously hard. So, in particular, how did we relate this quad matching problem to vector fields? You guys remember that? We thought about the plane, the, the tangent plane of the surface, like the complex numbers. We took the fourth root, right? And this is a way to take a vector and then kind of quadruple it four times. Let's say I have eight points in R3, right? So three orthogonal directions glued together, like the x, y, and z axis. How do I represent that? There's no more complex numbers to be had, only R3. It turns out quaternionic polynomials, like if you're thinking, remember that polyvector paper we talked about? And quaternions are used to represent stuff in R3. Quaternionic polynomials are really crazy objects. You should read about them online. They can have infinite numbers of roots of unity. Uh, so that doesn't end up panning out. Uh, it turns out this is actually quite challenging. Um, uh, and so we'll talk a tiny bit about it. But that's thing one. Uh, and even if you do it kind of naive way, like maybe I should have three vectors per point. <laughs> and I just deal with it in a non-convex fashion. Again, somehow the, the, the boundary geometry is, is, is uninteresting. You can ask the question, can I do the whole damn thing without meshing the interior at all? Uh, and, and that's even more tricky. 
So the, the object of interest in these field guided problems, yeah? What's the application of uh, like this? Hex It's a good question. So, so they show up in numerical PDE. Um, so the, there's an area called isogeometric analysis, uh, which has to do with you have different elements that you can place in a volume. They could be tetrahedra, they could be these things. Uh, there's a third one that could be extrusions of triangles. That third one is very rarely explained in geometry literature. Um, and, and you can put basis functions. Let's say when we talk about piecewise linear hat functions, you can put those on the, the corners of the cube. It turns out the approximation ratio for PDE here is better in the sense that I need fewer cubes to get a good approximation of the solution of a PDE problem. But the challenge we're in right now is that there's a chicken and egg uh, problem, uh, which is that that's really great. You can solve these PDEs really quickly because you don't need that many cubes to get a good approximation. However, the algorithms for extracting the cubes take like days. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so there's uh, somehow a conservation of headache uh, going on here that we haven't solved. So in any event, um, what we're looking for is an assignment of a rotation of a cube to every point in the interior of a volume. My, my goal in the next 20 minutes is to convince you guys that that's a hard space to think about. So remember the set of, 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 of crosses, right? That was really kind of like the angles between 0 and 90 degrees. And we have an idea what this space is, the set of rotations in the cube. Remember the SO3 is what we say is space of rotations. It's like orthogonal matrices. I talked about that this morning. So this is the quotient of SO3, where if I take a cube, I rotate it 90 degrees, it's the same cube. This is a messy space. This is something called a spherical three manifold. Uh, and it doesn't have any nice structure like, like the, the one that we have in, in 2D. It's just really depressing. But that doesn't stop us. We're in applications. We've got to think about these things anyway. Uh, and there's a really elegant uh, way to do it. Uh, how many of you guys have taken representation theory? I don't see any of the math students in this class, so I, 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 I doubt it. Um, so that, that turns out to be the right way to think about it. So let's say that I have a, I cook up a polynomial, x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus z to the fourth, and I restrict that to the unit sphere. Yeah, this is something I could do. Where are the local maxima of this function? Oh, come on, on the, on the unit sphere. What happens if I take a small number to the fourth power? Yeah, they're just the x, y, and z axes, and minus them. Yeah. So the peaks of this function are sort of exactly where I want to put that frame, in some sense. Yeah? Uh, and, and, and let's think about this for a second. So this is a degree four polynomial, right? I can always write it uh, uh, as follows, right? I can, I'm going to change my notation a little bit. I'm going to think of x like a vector. So f f of x, uh, let's call it x1 to the fourth plus x2 to the fourth plus x3 to the fourth. Let's say I wanted to represent a rotated frame, like, you know, rotated 20 degrees. How could I do it? One thing I could do is I could look at uh, uh, r transpose x. Let's say rotating my axes. And this is a new function on this here. Yeah? So, uh, so uh, yeah, so let's call this, you know, f sub r of x, right? So this is some other function of x. Here's the, the magic shape. So what does this really mean? This means, this is, like, let's think of, of r as having three columns, r1, r2, r3, like that. So then this is really r1 dot x to the fourth plus r2 dot x to the fourth plus r3 dot x to the fourth. That makes sense? This object is still a fourth degree polynomial. Do you see that? So no matter how I rotate my, my, my three axes, I can represent it using a rotation of this function, and it stays a fourth degree polynomial. Now how many fourth degree polynomials are there? Well, I can take all fourth degree polynomials, and I can write them in a particular fashion, right? So I, I have like what? I have uh, x to the fourth, I have x cubed y, I have x cubed z, I've got x squared y z, uh, and I can call it a big long list of monomials, right? And every one of my polynomials, I can think of f of r transpose x as really equal to some vector, which is a function of r, dot product of this giant thing of monomials. Anybody happen to know what this thing is called? This is called the fourth band representation of r, if you take representation theory. 
this is the thing that takes a polynomial and rotates it. And the really amazing, kind of cool, neat property here is that um, if I rotate a polynomial, it stays the same degree. It doesn't change. In fact, it, this polynomial, to make it even better, this is homogeneous. Like every term is fourth, fourth degree, and every term here is fourth degree. Now, how many fourth degree monomials are there? Let's think for a second. Maybe x, x to the fourth, x to the fourth. I, I, I would say more than three. <laughs> I think around 16. Yeah? How big is the space of rotations? So there's roll, pitch, and yaw. Yeah, so 3D. So what ends up happening is if I look at the, the orbit of f, in other words, I look at v of r over all r in SO3. All right, so this is some subset of r to the big. Yeah? There's some set of v's that corresponds to v of r's. Is this the set of all possible vectors v? No, it's some three-dimensional subset of this giant high-dimensional space. And in some sense, that is really the set of unknowns in this, this hex matching problem. Right? Because that's the space that's gluing together. Like, so for instance, if r is rotation by 90 degrees, this polynomial looks different if I write it in this form, but when I expand on the monomial basis, what's going to happen? Well, if I rotate this polynomial by 90 degrees, nothing changes. So the coefficients will be the same. That's the magic here. You see that? And so that, this object, this is called the orbit under SO3 of, 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 uh, of this particular map V, that is this thin three-dimensional space sitting in R to the 15, and that's the space of unknowns that we really care about in this problem. Yeah? Uh, and, 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 and so this idea originally uh, goes back to Wong and, and, and some other folks. Um, they didn't really write it in this fashion. I don't think they realized that that's really the story that they were telling. Um, this is the kind of schematic you have in mind, is that they say, okay, rather than having three axes, that's a hard work, thing to work with, I'm going to convert all of my frames into coefficients here. And now this is nice, because it just glues together those 90 degree rotations. I don't have to compute them. Yeah? And so here's the kind of picture, right? So instead of cubes, they transition to little rotations in this bumpy function. Yeah? Um, right, so uh, we, we did a little research on this too. Um, one of the interesting things is if you specify one of those three axes, well now it looks back like rotations between 0 and 90 degrees, and that's not such a hard set to deal with. Uh, and conveniently, that's what you have on the boundary, right? Because you know the normal direction, you shouldn't have to worry about the other two. So what we did is we just said, ah, ignore all the interior things and just interpolate the barn way. Conveniently using directly to normal on top of you know, you got a hammer, you might as well hit as many uh, nails as you can. Um, and unfortunately, what you get out in the interior are things that aren't frames, right? Like these things, notice they're scaled in funny ways. Then maybe you project back and you get some kind of out to usual thing. Uh, this is extremely heuristic technique, but it works quite well. So here's surfaces. You can see, like, if you look at the singular graph of this thing, let's see, where's the singular part? Like, right here. Notice that things kind of cut around it like a triangle. Um, so this actually forms a cube embedded in the interior of the sphere, which is the expected output of, of one of these files. Yeah? How are these rendered? How are they rendered? Painfully. I, mean, I made these renders, actually. Uh, so so uh, what I did is I integrated. So I, I sort of chose a streamline, and then for, followed forward, and then chose the one of the six directions that was closest to my current tangent and kept moving. And then did that a bunch of times. These are a bunch of cylinders, and then it's rendered in line. Turned out it took longer to render than to compute these fields, which is something that happens often in geometry. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the, but the basic issue in, in techniques like this is that what we got out was not what we wanted, right? They weren't rotations of this function. They were just points in this high dimensional space. Uh, and so a big effort in research uh, in our group is, well, okay, so the rotations of this one function are not the same as the set of all possible degree four polynomials. Right? This one is a small subset of the other. Uh, and indeed, um, this is something called the octahedral variety. You guys heard the term variety before? It comes from algebraic geometry. This refers to, like, I have a bunch of quadratic constraints on my point uh, uh, that cut out the space that I care about. Okay. Uh, right, and, and, and so this is some crazy uh, 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 space. If you like commutative diagrams, there's one. Um, right. So here, uh, the map of row. Uh, turns out you don't need all 15 monomials is enough to just consider spherical harmonic, but that's in detail. Um, the map rho is like going from rotations, which are in SO3, to these vectors V here. Uh, and then those, uh, you know, act on 
x to the fourth divided by the fourth with z to the fourth. That's the, the vertical arrow here, right? The same way I could take SO3 and quotient it by the set of cubes, and that's over here, and there's some map that, that, that com completes the diagram, which is what we, we've really done here, yeah? Uh, so if, if you actually want to solve this problem where you're looking for coefficients of this rotated function, that turns out to be an extremely non-convex, crazy uh, problem to solve, but you can do it in a non-convex, crazy fashion, uh, and, and there's some nice algorithms. So, uh, in particular, um, there are two that are maybe worth knowing in this class. One is called Riemannian trust region. So the idea here is that our variables do sit on a manifold. This is the SO3, space of rotation. So it's like gradient descent, where you're constrained to move along a curved object. That's what, what this thing is. Uh, there's MBO, which is Merriman something and Osher. I'm sorry for the B, I apologize. Um, which corresponds to, like, you know, so here's my, the manifold I want to be on, and some curved object but he's sitting in some higher dimensional space. And so in that algorithm, you step off of your own manhood a little bit and project back. Yep. This is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to these problems. They look innocent. It looks like just a way of these stamps. You know, you take your 2D problem, you add a dimension, and then everything is the same. But you can see that it's just completely different. Yeah? Um, by the way, if you go to dimension 4, then it becomes really good. There's, there's something weird about odd numbers. Um, one question you might ask, uh, we talk about rotations of the cube. What happens if you allow your cube to stretch a little bit? You know, so instead of x to the fourth, y to the fourth, and z to the fourth, now I'm happy to put a little exponent in front of it. And then you get a different manifold. This is called the orthogonally decomposable tensors. The first known uh, algebraic facts about that were developed here at MIT by a postdoc who's still here. This is some indicator. Uh, as to, like, you know, we used to be in the 1800s in, in our math. We, we bumped up a uh, hundred or so years. Um, the point here being, here are two singular curve, sets of singular curves and a, and a hex mesh, right? Here's one where I kind of just took a quad mesh and extruded it downward. This is handled well by the tools that we've already talked about. Um, here's a singular point with a bunch of singular edges coming in. This is just obtained by gluing together a bunch of cubes. And some crazy stuff can go on at these singular points. So around singular edges, all that can happen is like, oh, there are five cubes instead of four. It turns out, uh, in fact, maybe we'll jump forward a few slides. Um, that you can classify all kinds of interesting topologies that happen in 3D uh, 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 at singular points. So here's actually a little list of all the ones that can happen with low degree. Um, higher than this, and you can show that these are not useful for finding elements. Uh, uh, and, and you can see that just by gluing together cubes, you should try this at home. If you just have cubes, you can do this. Uh, uh, you can get singular points which actually really don't correspond, like correspond to knots that are bending around the, the, the point in all kinds of crazy ways. Yeah? Uh, right, so, so we, we thought a little bit about that. I thought just as one additional visualization of like what it will take. These are open problems, by the way. We now have reached the end of what is known about uh, these volumetric problems for the fields. Um, as one more indicator of why this singular graph picture, uh, oops, like why this, this picture of singular points is difficult. My student David generated some really cool animations that show some things that shouldn't happen or do in, in these worlds. Um, so here, uh, what David has done, so this is the easy case. Uh, here's a bunch of cubes. Right? You could roughly glue these things together to get a, a hex mesh. So what happens as these things rotate? Well, when, they're all, when they all have the same tensor, so think about like I'm trying to mesh a cylinder. So I take a bunch of layers of these cubes and just stack them on each other. So if they all have the same tangent, we're, we're kind of happy, right? That, that ends up working out. Okay? Um, what happens if I take this animation, I play it a little bit, to like this point here? So this corresponds to like kind of a spiral staircase going up the side of the singular point in the center. Is that meshable? It turns out no. There's no, provably no way to glue together uh, uh, hexes in a way where that will close up when I, I go around the spiral staircase. That's really frightening. Uh, and, and to make matters worse, um, here's an example where, you know, we talked about the hoff poincare gray theorem in class, right, where I can look at, in this case, you see that there's a 2 pi rotation when I go around the singular point, like the cube rotates out 360 degrees. And so now, because we're in 3D, the cubes are allowed to rotate out of the plane, right? So I can do things like rotate them about the diagonal axis. And look at what happens. This is totally amazing and frightening. What used to be degree, you know, a two pi singularity becomes what a one third singularity when, when it flips around the other way. Um, so here, let me see if I can pause it. 
So here we start out with the, the same thing, and these are just rotating. This is a homotopy. And when they flip over, it becomes a different singular type. So somehow the behavior that used to be integer is now smooth, um, which is what, what makes these problems really hard. Here's another nice example. So here's a 3, 5 uh, flip. So there's one configuration, there's the other. Um, and here's one more example. Right, so here's another just rotating 90 degrees. Uh, and they go from one pattern to, to another. This is all to say that if you're looking for really challenging topological problems, <laughs> three manifolds is a place to look. You don't even need to mention bigger than three. This is already hard enough. Okay, so in our last like couple minutes here, I'll tell you about one more problem uh, that involves volumes in a very different fashion. Yeah. So why do we need tab mesh, and how does tab mesh become such an input for the first part? Well, that's a good question, right? So, so in the first paper we did, right? We got rid of the, the, the tab mesh altogether. The problem here with this extremely nonlinear constraint, which is staying in the space of, of, of octahedral frames. And I don't know of any way to enforce it. Is it very sensitive to the attack mesh? Uh, the, no, I mean, there's a lot of tests in these kinds of papers to make sure that you're not, but it's the kind of thing that you have to check, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so now let's talk about something completely different. This is actually the topic of my talk tomorrow at NYU, but then it goes off in a very different direction involving the uh, uh, civil rights law. Um, Here's political uh, voting districts in the United States and North Carolina as of 2012. These were voted unconstitutional. Uh, you might see <laughs> roughly why. Uh, so there's one, two, three, four, five uh, cities in the state of North Carolina. I challenge you to name a sixth. Um, uh, and, and so this, uh, other people that lived in this region in the state of, of North Carolina uh, elected a single uh, representative to, to the United States uh, Congress. Uh, and, and so the, the, this is an example of, of a phenomenon in the United States, right? So uh, once every 10 years, the census comes out, they collect every, all the data of all the people in the state, tell you where they live, and then typically your state legislature, although that's changing, um, will take your state and make a, graph part, make, a, make a partition. They will divide it up into uh, districts, each of which elects a single person to Congress. Yeah? And over the years, this has evolved from roughly like a Voronoi problem uh, to something a little more adversarial. Where, what do you do? Well, maybe I really want to elect somebody of a particular political leaning to Congress. So what I do is I take everybody who isn't of that leaning, pack them all into one district, and now the rest of my state looks and it looks uh, very different uh, than it would otherwise. Okay. This is uh, something called gerrymandering. I believe we are currently in the first gerrymandering. We're right on the boundary. It's in Massachusetts. Um, certainly, my house is like smack dab in the middle. Uh, it, it always comes from an old political cartoon. So there are many different ways to understand gerrymandering. The way that people used to complain about it, this has changed in the last two or three years, largely due to actually our work with, with our friends at Tufts, um, was to say, well, OK, if I look at the shape, somehow there's clearly, if nothing else, this is not a Borne region. Right? This is a clear indicator that something else, some other consideration went into design on this object. There's a different question as to whether that's fair. That's a separate matter. Right? Um, but, but, but you certainly, at least this is an indicator that something other than geometry has, has, has taken place here. Yeah? Uh, but there, there's a problem. So, so a lot of folks in political science uh, went about trying to quantify that, like to look at a shape and quantify its kind of weird shapiness. Right? This is something we call compactness, which is not the mathematical version of compactness, but just kind of like how circle-like is your shape. Right? And a typical way to do that is to look at Area divided by perimeter squared. Anybody know what this ratio is called? Or just a 2D shape? It's called the isoparametric ratio. And that's because it is, what, minimized? Maximized uh, for a circle. Right? The circle is the most area I can pack into the fixed perimeter. But this is called Dido's problem. Uh, it dates back to what, I think about 800 BC. Uh, amusingly, in political science, and it's called the Polsby Popper score, it dates back to 1993. <laughs> Uh, but I digress. But there, there, there's a big issue uh, with this score. Um, here are three different maps of, of a part of Maryland that I downloaded from the US Census, and I computed the score, and it's 12%, 7%, 4%. .4%. Those are not like numerical precision errors. What went wrong? Yeah. I guess the coastline paradox? The coastline paradox. Well, what about it? <laughs> Colton, tell me more. <laughs> the resolution. Oh. Yeah, it just seems yeah, the resolution, as you increase the resolution of like something like ge ge uh, geographic, like a coast, it will increase the surface. Yeah, coastline is approximately fractal. It makes no sense to measure perimeter. 
right? The parameter here is probably infinity. Yeah, and this is true of, of almost any shape. It really makes sense, no sense to, to measure perimeter because, like, if you take a piece of string, you can pack a lot of string in a two-dimensional region. Yeah? Uh, right. So uh, there's kind of an interesting scenario going on, and this literally is playing out in our courts. This is a really funny case for geometry uh, prison in everyday life. People use this measurement, uh, but it depends more on what map they downloaded than on uh, the shape of their their voting district. In fact, we have a fun paper on, on that's going to appear in a political analysis journal that uses this adversarially and says like, let's say I would like my district to look good, what map should I download? And then it shows you you can do that with surprisingly high control. Hello. Um, right, so uh, uh, there's a, mathematics actually does offer a solution to this problem. Um, it's something called the isoparametric profile. So here you have a shape, here's a dumbbell. This is familiar to TA. And uh, you can ask a, a particular optimization problem which is let's prescribe an area which is less than the area of your shape. And I'm going to say, what is the minimum amount of perimeter that I need to inscribe a shape with that amount of area? So first of all, when the area equals the area of the shape, what number do I get? I just get the perimeter. I need the whole shape to, to fill it up. Right? But as I kind of pull air out of that balloon, I have different options for how I can stick the balloon in the shape. Does that make sense? Now the nice thing, obviously when t is like 100% of the volume, this thing doesn't tell you anything. As t decreases, these little tendrils that happen in the fractally part of your shape get pulled, they get sucked away. And what's left is something that is stable to boundary perturbation, which is what we're after. Here's the only problem. How do I compute this thing? I don't. This is, a, this is, a hard, is it an open computational geometry problem. Given a polygon, how to find the shape, and given a polygon and an area which is less than the area of the polygon, can you find the inscribed shape with the minimum amount of perimeter with that prescribed area? Nice computation of geometry challenge. My suspicion is it's NPR, but I'm not 100 Actually, I can't show, I, I waver on that one, I'm not 100 percent sure. But in any event, we don't know how to do it. Um, so one way that we can do it is to relax the problem a little bit and use a level set method when we're at it. Um, so, uh, in the level set method view of the geometry world, it's quite different from what we, we've talked about in this class. So in this class, we've largely taken a uh, uh, Lagrangian perspective to geometry. What that means is that we have meshes for our shapes, like an explicit boundary object. But there's this whole other view of the world, uh, which is very popular, especially in fluid dynamics, um, which is, is, is called Eulerian fluid dynamics. It's also a big tank of water that's sloshing around. Yeah? I claim there are two different ways to describe the sloshiness of my water. Yeah? One of them is I look at time zero, and my water is composed of a bunch of molecules, and now at time seven, it's always seven. I can come up with a map from time zero to time seven telling me where every molecule went. Okay? And that map evolves with time. That would be kind of the Lagrangian perspective. I know where all the points are. There's a different perspective, which is Eulerian, and that means I'm a barnacle, and I sit on the side of the tank, I just count the number of molecules moving past in the direction they're moving in. That's kind of the vector field perspective. Okay, so if you think about like the pressure field, right? The pressure field, the, like the, the base points of the vectors don't move as the you know pressure moves across the Earth. Right? The base points move stay the same, and the, the vectors just change. Right? That perspective is called Eulerian, and that's closer to uh, what level set method is trying to do. Yeah? So here's a, here's a nice example. So let's say that I have an inscribed shape. Omega. Then one way to describe that in Eulerian fashion is to look at this function, which is equal to um, one. So let's say this is a function of x, where if x is inside of your shape and zero otherwise. Cool. So what if I wanted? Um, let's start easy. Let's say that I wanted the area. Of my shape. How can I do it? Integrate the, the characteristic function. Okay. Yeah, this is the integral of this function. Okay. No, no, no more challenging. Um, what if I want the perimeter? No, 
McCoy. So what's the difference between who and what? Adjacent. Yeah, another adjacent. This is another one. It's going to be the test of McCoy. But you've got the right intuition, uh, which is like, let's say that I have a function on a grid, right? So here's like the indicator of shape, and here's. <laughs> As you point out, let's say that I make one number per n, where I subtract adjacent values, like that. Right? So for every n, I take the value of my function, then I subtract, and I add them all together. What am I going to get? Well, in the interior of the shape, I'm going to get 0, because right? this is 1 minus 1. On the outside, I'm going to get 0. And when I'm left with this perimeter, What's the problem over here is that this is a function. I can't do that. I don't have any grid points. But it turns out that you can almost do that using a formula which is going to look totally obtuse to for a second, um, which is the following. arbitrary function, and actually a vector field in my domain. Uh, and you take its divergence, and multiply it against this thing and integrate, and then look at the biggest possible value of this thing for any vector field whose norm is less than one point -less. I claim this is equal to the parameter. Is this obvious? No, it's not. Uh, so this is something... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, one way that you can get there is this thing in general. So this is, uh, let's say that if we're function f here, then this object is called the total variation of f. When f is smooth, I can write it in a different fashion, which is that this is the integral of the gradient of f not squared. So remember, we spent all this time talking about directly energy in this class. This thing is almost like directly energy, but there's no square there. Yeah? So I can no longer do all that cool least square stuff that I did before. Um, by the way, can you convince you guys, yourself that these two things are the same? How do you think I'm going to do it? Oh, by the way, it should be. You got the right gesture, now what are the words? <laughs> integration by parts, yeah? So if I, if I integrate by parts, it's going to be a dot product with an arbitrary vector whose length is less than 1. And I want to make this as big as possible. How do I? Oh, so there is another one. <laughs> How do I do that? You make it 1 and make it Yeah, you make unit length with the direction of f, of grad f, which is exactly this value here. But why do I write it this way? Well, this is because this, this guy doesn't have to be differentiable anymore. But I, this number still exists. Right? So one thing you can uh, check is if we have the indicator function of the region, Right? We think the gradient, well, where is it non-zero? It's non-zero, like, in some spiritual sense, like, right along the boundary. Like, if I blurred this function out just a tiny bit, that's where the gradient would be. And so that's why this number is really measuring perimeter. In fact, you can prove that that's true. This is a calculus section, so it's actually not that hard, but it, but it, it does require a little bit of thinking. Here's the nice thing. This thing is convex. <laughs> yeah? So, uh, let's see here. Um, how can I solve my problem? I could say, uh, well, I'm going to, if we ignore regularity stuff, I could say, uh, some function of f, not squared, because I know that's secretly perimeter. You know? um, subject to, well, the, the volume needs to be prescribed. Right? And there's my isoparametric problem with one additional constraint. which is that my function is binary everywhere, right? Because that makes it define a shape, right? This is convex, this is convex, and this is not. So what are we going to do? We've seen this pattern a lot. We're going to make that an integral instead. Now this thing is solvable. Uh, and that's the kind of standard st style of, 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 of trick in, in uh, these sorts of level set methods. Notice that like this would make no sense in Lagrangian view of the world, right? Because now what I've said is my boundary and my shape is some fuzzy thing, right? Um, and this is uh, this thing that we call a total variation profile. It has lots of beautiful properties uh, hiding in it. Um, one thing you can show uh, is that it's a convex function of time. It still has an isoparametric inequality after you make this approximation. So in some sense, it still measures what you want. 
there's a really surprise. So these these things are. Easy. I wrote these proofs. This one was written by a mathematician collaborator, which is that the optimal f. If the optimal f took on two values zero and one, then I would have solved this problem by accident. It turns out it almost does. It takes on three values: <laughs> zero, one, and something else. Um, this is not this is not obvious from this form, right? It could take on an infinite number of values, but it turns out it doesn't. It's a three suffices. This is surprising. Uh, it requires some sort of analytical uh, argument. But in any event, um, so here's an example of what it looks like. So here's um, the sequence of, of indicator functions for a shape as, as time in increases. You can see it looks like a compact inscribed thing that's just gluing on uh, more and more kind of non-compact pieces, which is what you'd expect. Um, and, and these plots really conveniently do show you uh, sort of the difference between these different regions. So here, let's see. In fact, I forget which one is which, but I guess I can read it up. So NC11 would be North Carolina in 2011, which is the non-compact one we saw before. And in D, you can see that plot kind of sitting on top. And um, when they replaced it with a compact plant, the plot, these things kind of shrunk down. But the interesting thing to notice is that right on the right-hand side, they actually switch order because this is just noise. Right? Um, yeah, so that's actually a nice way of measuring compactness. Did it measure fairness? No, the 2016 plan uh, arguably also is, is quite discriminated, but it, but it, but it looks like a, a boring attack. Um, that's a separate matter. Uh, in case you're wondering, you can do this in 3D. So there's a rubber duck with its head cut off. Um, but I think the really critical uh, takeaway from, from this area, I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, is that really this is a totally an important problem for redistricting? It's kind of an interesting one uh, mathematically. What really matters is understanding your, your district and all the statistics associated to it, and like, what are your options for this problem, and so on, which is a, a totally different style of research problem involving random sampling, the space of partitions, that kind of stuff. Those are, are fun. If you like that stuff, you should come talk to me from real. But as a 10 second extension of something that is relevant to our course, when we did all these vector field design tools by uh, essentially all our design tools, we wanted something to be smooth, we took this Laplacian, and then we minimized. Yeah, we saw that about a thousand different times. Well, now I just gave you finally something that wasn't the Laplacian that also measures smoothness. And I can throw that at, at, at a lot of the problems we've already talked about in this course, and it turns out that it had some nice effects. Um, so, for instance, um, here's a nice, really evil counterexample for quad meshing. Um, so, a quad mesh, this is like a cube where somebody took a cube, <coughs> like took some air and kind of blew it into the inside. Um, but they did it in such a way where the curvature of the faces of the cube go at 45 de degree angles to the corners. So, what's going to happen when I use most of these field guided meshing techniques is the field will say, oh, great, there's curvature this way, and that's where I should place my field, where I should have a bunch of plus signs like that. But for quad meshing, that's exactly the wrong answer. You see that? You, what you want to do is align with the sharp features here. Yeah? Um, and one of the really beautiful uh, observations that our, our student Paul made is that you can take the total variation of your vector field, uh, and actually what this measures, um, it, 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 it decomposes into <coughs> multiple terms. One that looks like smoothness in the interior parts, and then one, if you integrate by parts again, because this is all we know how to do in my research group, uh, is a term that measures the alignment of your field to the sharp creases on the, on the mesh. Uh, so this actually gives you the proper output that you would want for, for meshes. Um, this is an interesting case where political redistricting has affected the way that we quad mesh. Um, <laughs> so here uh, you can see uh, the typical uh, output of, of, of these meshing tools, and you can see that the, the, the size of the quads are aligned the wrong way with the features. Um, whereas if you just replace uh, directly energy with total variation, now it's aligned nicely to the sharp corners. Uh, and you get what you want. So not terribly useful for uh, redistricting, but super useful if, if you care about quad meshes. So in any event, hopefully I've convinced you guys that like any of the topics that we, we, we thought about in this class, essentially you can just bump the dimension up by one, and very little is known. Um, and I think that's the case for many of the stuff we've covered. That essentially, uh, you know, we really hit up onto the boundary of, of what's known and what's not in geometry processing and taking almost any of the problems, whether it's in machine learning, shape processing, vector fields, Laplacian, what have you, are adjacent to all kinds of really interesting challenges. You know, numerically, I wouldn't make them Anyway, with that, we're out of time. So I will see you guys on Thursday. Please get your presentations together. Put the links on the spreadsheets. Send me your reports. Don't make them too long. I don't want to read long reports. Like, it better like, blow my mind if it's more than how 10 pages or whatever. Yeah. 10 pages is a lot. Cool? Cool. All right, so with that, we will see you guys next week. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming to our.